this time on the Families Matter Most podcast. The four horsemen that predict divorce and unhappy marriages are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. And I want to tell you, there's something better than that. We can change. We can learn better ways to communicate. There are ways that you can learn to share what you're feeling in a way that doesn't come across poorly. It doesn't come across as manipulative, that you can do it in a way that feels good to you. It feels honest and it gets results. Your partner loves you. Every time Jen Dean speaks, I can see hope, knowledge, expertise, wisdom, and love. When Jen Dean speaks about parenting, we make sure that we are there to listen because we know we will get valuable advice. Families Matter Most with Jen Dean. She doesn't just give skills for us to be better parents, but she teaches us how to reach our children's hearts. And at the end of the day, that's what truly matters. This podcast is going to be terrible. (laughs) I mean, terrible. This is awful and wonderful and freeing and encouraging and helpful and hard and painful. Today, I'm going to talk to you about what I learned were the four biggest predictors of divorce. Ouch, right? They're called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and it is not mine. I did not make this up. This was from Dr. John Gottman. He researched couples, and he predicted which couples would remain the happiest, the strongest, and stay together years later. And I'm going to share with you the four biggest predictors of divorce and then what to do, you know, the positive side, how to prevent these things from happening. So there's good news in all of this too. I have seen myself in all four of these at one time in my marriage. So I can agree these were awful and I did them. And yet, I learned better ways. I worked on things. I learned new skills. My husband and I have the strongest marriage we've ever had, ever. So I don't want you to turn this off. Don't think, oh, it's too late for me. I'm too far gone. Our marriage, you know, is terrible. It's We're never going to have that kind of happy marriage. I want to tell you, yes, yes, you really can. You really can. Because there was a time in our marriage where both Sean and I felt pretty hopeless. And yet there's always hope. So I want to encourage you today. So don't turn it off. The last one in particular was by far the biggest predictor. So stay with me till the end. There is good news here. (laughs) A big thank you to Connexus, sponsor of the podcast. Next time you're stuck in traffic for a while or stuck behind a train on the ring road, here's some things to think about. Instead, of why we have a train going through one of the biggest, you know, roads in town. Why do we do this? What if your bank was committed to working with you to achieve your goals? What if they cared enough to get to know you? What if they weren't successful unless you were? What if your financial well-being truly drove everything your bank did? Come and see why things are different at Connexus. Stop by any branch to learn more about how Conexus cares. And please tell them that you heard about them from Families Matter Most podcast. I want them to to feel the love that I have for them. Thank you so much, Conexus. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse by Dr. John Gottman. This is from his research. And for years, what he and his team did is they actually had an apartment for newlyweds. It was kind of like a free like weekend getaway, but they agreed to be researched and studied. So they had in certain areas of the apartment, uh, they had, you know, one way glass and they had microphones and they were listening and watching body language and recording how these couples related and communicated to one another. And then they followed these couples. They came back periodically over years and they were over time able to kind of predict, okay, which of these marriages succeeded, which failed, and why. And it's fascinating. He came up with four things, four things that can predict divorce. And as I said earlier, the last one is the number one predictor, and I did it. So there's a good chance you're going to hear yourself in this. So I'm going to share with you quickly 
what the four negatives are, and then we're going to go a little more in depth into each one, and I'm going to share the negative and then also the opposite, the positive, what we can intentionally be doing instead to make a difference in our relationships. I've seen myself in these in my husband, like in my relationship with my husband, but also with my kids, also with myself. So there's lots to unpack here, but let's just let's just get to the research, the four things, the four horsemen that predict divorce and unhappy marriages are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Contempt is that last one. That one has a star beside it. So criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. <sighs> Moms and dads, we're tired. Think back to when you first had your kids and all of a sudden your world changes. It's not about your schedule, your priorities anymore. It's about survival, right? It's about how can we survive this? How do we get just enough sleep to function? How can we just barely pay our bills? How can we just get enough groceries? How can we just survive this schedule? What what can we do to just manage life? It's all about survival mode. And that just becomes a breeding ground for negativity. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I can get really negative. I start being super critical. I pick out all the things that are wrong with me and my husband and my kids and the world and everything around me. I just see the negatives so much more than the positives when I'm tired. So perhaps an overall solution to this is rest. Maybe if we just could get a little bit more sleep somehow, or recognize that it's a season. Hey, you have a newborn, you have a toddler who's up in the night. This will pass. I always like to encourage couples not to make a big decision in the first year of their baby. Don't make any big decision. We're not moving. We're not changing jobs. We're not changing partners. We're not leaving each other. We are in this together. We got to figure it out, even if it means like just barely surviving this thing. Because none of us are at our best. None of us. It's almost like it's the final exam of some crazy test and you're just crawling your way through. You're just inching, trying to do it as best you can. So the idea of excellence is gone at this point. We're just trying to make it through. So have some grace for yourself. If you're in a tough season right now, still try and work on some of these things. Recognize that they're not helping you, but also have grace that this is maybe not your A+. Plus time of life. Maybe this is your B minus. Maybe this is the good enough. Can I get my house clean enough? Can I do a good enough job with the schedule? Can I do a good enough job taking care of myself and, and exercising? Maybe that's the season you're in and we're not going to just hold ourselves to all of this perfection and then just add in all of these things we're failing at in our marriage too. <laughs> I know you can do that. I've been there. Don't do that. The first one, criticism. Verbally attacking your partner's personality or character. This one is tough and I feel like we all have done it, but is there a pattern of that? Criticism, a lot of criticism is not helpful. I feel like it kind of ties in with sarcasm and I know some people really love sarcasm and it's fun for them. I just want to caution you, be careful that it's fun. Be careful that it stays fun. Be careful that your partner thinks it's fun. Because if it's not fun, then this is actually criticism. It's a jab in the form of a joke and it's negative and it brings people down. So just, just caution on that. If we're attacking the character, it's at their core. So it's not like you did a bad job with the kids this morning. It's like you're a bad parent. We're criticizing who they are. It's not about what they've done. It's not about they failed at this thing. It's we are criticizing them at their very core. It's not helpful at all. This is the eye rolling. This is the sigh and the, oh, like what a dumb guy or she always does this. This is the, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get it right? Why can't you just do this? You always da, 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 da. And in the last podcast, we covered some of those words, some of those hurtful, biting words that are marriage killers that if we can just clean up our language a little bit, it can help our conflict to be a little more healthier. This can help to avoid lots of this criticism right here. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do this right? That's criticizing 
someone's character instead of the problem of, hey, you forgot to change the diaper again. Can we talk about it? All of a sudden now we're telling them they're a horrible parent. That's the difference. We know that. We know it. And we've all fallen into it. Let's just decide right now that as of this moment, we're really going to be careful of that. We don't want to criticize. We don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that guy or that girl that's criticizing, that's looking for the negative, that's nitpicking, that's critical. You don't want to be that person. So let's decide today that we're going to choose to see the good. And when we do have to talk about an issue, let's keep it to the issue and not the core of their whole being. So that's criticism. So the solution is to look for something good. It's to and intentionally, actively look for something. It's about talking about issues with I statements. I felt upset when I came home and nothing was done. I felt upset when I came home and I realized you forgot to take your son to soccer. I felt angry when you said this to me. Notice it's an I and it's attached to a feeling. Also, you can express what you'd like. I'm upset that nobody's helping around the house. I would really like some help. I would like someone to take on the laundry. Like make it a specific thing. Keep it to the circumstance. So use I words, attach it with a feeling, and then you can express something that you would like. What are you hoping would happen instead? That's how you contradict the criticism. Number two, defensiveness. Defensiveness is a marriage killer. And oh, it's so tricky because really it's warding off attack. It's protecting yourself from a perceived hurt. You can't you can't accept responsibility for something, so you have to try and place the blame on someone else. It's almost like you make yourself the victim. Well, at least I, well, you always do this to me. So you're trying to switch it. So instead of you taking responsibility, you become the victim. And so we can start crying. Well, it's just so hard for me. I don't, you don't understand. I don't know what to do. Or we can try and put it on the other person and say, well, you do it. You did it first and you did it last week and you did this thing and that's worse. So you're more wrong than me. <laughs> You see, I'm an expert in this. Terrible. It's trying to get yourself out of trouble. It's reversing the blame. Defensiveness is self-protection and retaliation to ward off a perceived attack. So it shifts the focus away from the problem onto either your flaws, like, oh, it's not your fault, you can't help it, or your partner's flaws. Not helpful. Let's keep it to the issue at hand. The solution here, as hard as it is, is to take a step towards your partner and to own what's yours to own. We teach that with our kids, right? I teach parents to help their kids learn to take responsibility for themselves, even if they're only 10% at fault. They have to own that 10%. And the same is true with you. I know. <laughs> I know, nobody wants to hear this. I know, you have to take responsibility, except even if you disagree, can you accept your partner's perspective? Can you say something like, I could see how from your perspective, it seemed really hurtful. You could say, I didn't intend for it to be that way, but I can see how it might've come across to you. I can see that, I can understand that. Or you could say, I had no idea that this would happen and I didn't think that it would be a problem, but I can see now that I hurt you and I am really sorry for that. I did not mean to hurt you ever. See how you can own what's yours to own and it's not fake. It is not the, please, please, please do not do the, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. Please don't do that. Clearly you hurt their feelings or this wouldn't be an issue, right? So just own it. So instead of saying, I'm sorry if, just say, I'm really sorry that I hurt your feelings. I did not intend to. I had no idea that it would. I, I didn't mean to at all. And I'm really sorry that it did. Please forgive me for that. We can still take ownership. Even if it was an accident, we can still apologize. We make our kids do that, don't we? We make our kids apologize, even if it was an accident. I hit you as I was running past. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. We make our kids apologize. We can do the same thing. Take a step towards your partner, try and see it from their point of view instead of being defensive and take responsibility. Own what's yours to own. I know all of these are easy to say right? <laughs> in the heat of the moment. 
Not so simple. This third one is stonewalling. Uh, this is withdrawal. This is shutting down. And some people do it to avoid because they don't like conflict. Some people use it as a tool of manipulation. Either way, it's not helpful. This is the stomping, slamming, walking out of the house, shutting the door, taking off, going for a drive without talking about it. This is even just shutting down, you know, verbally. I just refuse to talk to you. The silent treatment. Anybody have that growing up? I had some of that. One of my parents would give me the silent treatment. And it was to punish me for, for disobeying or talking back. Anybody have that? Stonewalling? <sighs> it's not helpful. It's not helpful. Women are terrible for this. Can I just say? We're terrible for this. We're going to let you know that we're angry, even though we won't say it. What's wrong? Nothing. How are you? Fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. I don't care. Like, we're really bad bad for that. And I think it's because we haven't learned proper conflict management. We haven't learned how to fight well. We haven't learned how to be assertive. There's a whole other podcast on that, on how women are taught, right, to be meek and just go with the flow and don't, don't cause an issue. Just stay quiet, right? Just ignore it. And so we haven't been taught how to be assertive in a healthy way. So sometimes we default to some of these manipulative ways. And truly, sometimes it is a way to show everyone that we're mad without having to say it and to punish people. And sometimes it's subconscious. Sometimes we're just shutting down. We just can't, we just can't figure it out. So we just kind of deal with it in our own way. And we go and angry clean for a couple of hours. That happens too. The solution, the solution is to learn how to take care of yourself and how to take care of the problem. So the solution is tough. But remember, if you're thinking, well, you know, I don't want to look at my stuff and I don't want to learn how to be assertive and I don't want to learn how to fight properly and I don't want to know how to stand up for myself. It's too hard. If, if that's what you're thinking right now, just remember that stonewalling, the silent treatment, the stomping, the slamming, all of that without talking about it, that is not one of the four predictors of unhappy marriages and divorce. So you're thinking it's fine, it's fine, whatever. It's not fine. This is not okay. It hurts relationships everywhere. It hurts your kids. It hurts you because somewhere deep down, you feel like you're not worth standing up for. Somewhere deep down, you feel like, I don't know how to fix this and it feels helpless and I feel defeated and I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to be upset about it without any hope for it to change. And I want to tell you, there's something better than that. We can change. We can learn better ways to communicate. There are ways that you can learn to share what you're feeling in a way that doesn't come across poorly. It doesn't come across as manipulative, that you can do it in a way that feels good to you. It feels honest and it gets results. Your partner loves you. They want to hear you. They want a healthy relationship. So if you can just work on what's yours to work on, it will make a difference. It's not okay to slam, to stomp, to walk away. That's not okay. What you can do is learn to be assertive, and I can help you with that. But also learn, it's called self-soothing regulation. It's, it's how to calm down. Really, that's what it is. Learn how to get calm in a way that isn't the angry clean, the slamming, or the taking off. Learn how to get calm in a way that will bring you back together so you can talk about it again. So the walking away is possible. You can decide together, okay, when we're getting really heated, we're gonna take five or 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is you need, and then we're gonna come back and talk about it. It is not replacing the conflict. It's not replacing communication. It's just pausing it so that you guys can get calm and then you can come back and keep talking about it. That's. That's the goal. We need to learn ways to get calm. And it it could be whatever works for you, some deep breathing, going for a power walk, doing a workout really fast if, if that works for you guys. It could be, I'm just gonna go for a quick drive. It could be, you know what, I just need five minutes. I'm just gonna go sit in the backyard. It could be, you know what, I don't wanna leave, but I just need a second. I just need a pause. Let's just take 60 seconds here. Let's just sit here and think for a moment about each other's perspective and what they're trying to say. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe just in your own head, as your partner is talking, you can be talking to yourself saying, you know what, it's not about me, this is about the problem. I do that sometimes, I'll say it's not about me, 
It's not about me. It's about the problem. What is the emotion underneath it? How is, how is this person feeling? I do this with my partner. I do this with my kids. I'll say, what are they feeling underneath all of this? Like they're angry right now. They're telling me they're upset with me, but what's underneath that? Is it fear? Is it sadness? Is it rejection? Did I hurt them without meaning to? Did I hurt them on purpose? Like what, what is actually going on? What is the problem? Like peeling back the layers of the onion. Sometimes I try and do that and I try to, to be curious and investigate it that way. I think the easiest, the easiest way, if you feel like stonewalling is an issue, the easiest place to start, and this has been proven to help, and this is what Gottman does in his therapy, is he he actually prescribes little short breaks. So even you sit in your chair, you don't get up and leave, but we're gonna take just a couple of minutes. We're gonna, you know, just take some deep breaths, put on a song, close your eyes if you want, and we're just gonna pause, just pause. Before it gets out of control heated and you're in that spiral and you're screaming out horrible things that you don't really think, but you're so mad, you wanna hurt them, and so you say awful things. We don't, we don't wanna get to that place. So take a break, spend that time doing something soothing, maybe a little bit distracting, take the dog for, for a walk, do what you need to do there so that you can come back and work on it. And the last one, the last one. Now this one has the star beside it. This is contempt. This one uh, is the worst one. This is attacking their sense of self with an intent to insult. This is when, hmm, this is when you truly think someone is stupid. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, I, this is the eye rolling, the sarcastic comments again. But what's different is you're not criticizing, you're not saying they're a terrible father or, you know, they're a bad mother or they're not good with the kids. You're saying they're awful. They're an awful person. And I'm embarrassed of them. And I'm, you know, humiliated and I regret. And they are inadequate. Like deep down, you feel like you're better than them. Oh, that was awful to say out loud, wasn't it? Deep down, you feel like you're better than them and they are lesser than you. And you may not ever say those words, but if you're thinking it, they're feeling it. Come on, right? They're feeling it in your body language, in the way that you respond, in the words, in, in the cutting remarks, they're feeling that, they sense it. And how, how lonely, how rejecting is that when their partner, to them, clearly feels like they're not good enough. They don't measure up. Something's wrong with them. That's just so sad. And, and I can say that Sean and I have struggled with this, where we have, we have felt that way. I personally... I know there was a time early in our marriage where I felt like I was doing all the work. My partner wasn't doing enough. I know this, that's crazy because my partner does like Sean, Sean does tons. But when I was tired and I had all these little kids at home, I felt completely alone and isolated. I felt like he just went to work all day and he got a break and I never got, got a break. And I just, I don't know. I felt like I was doing everything and he was doing nothing. And it just spiraled into, into contempt. And I look back and I can see those seeds were there of me just wanting to look down on him and everything he did was wrong and nothing he did was good enough. And of course, when you're looking for negatives, your brain will find them. I started seeing all of his flaws and they were magnified and they were getting bigger and there was more of them. And then I would see more evidence to prove that, look, he's actually, you know, a dumb idiot guy and he doesn't know anything. And it's awful because all this time, who do I think I am? <laughs> really? <sighs> I was tired and I'm grateful that I learned some of these, these tools and I realized, you know what? Uh, he was created with different strengths that I'm just choosing not to see. I'm comparing him to something that isn't fair. To perfection? Probably. I'm comparing him to perfection. And that's not right. When it changed for me in our marriage is when I decided 
to look for the good in him. He's not like anyone else. He's different. He's not like me. He has different strengths. And when I chose to start looking for those, I saw more and more and more of them. And it got easier for me to see more positives. And the things that frustrated me became smaller. They weren't so obvious. I could see more of the positives. So the solution to contempt, according to Gottman, is to build a culture of appreciation. Remind yourself of your partner's positive qualities and find gratitude for positive actions. I was not very grateful. I was not very kind. And that that is my regret, that I was not a really nice person to him for a few years there. I'm grateful that we worked it out. I'm grateful that both of us did some work in our marriage and in our own lives personally. And as we started building that culture of appreciation, we did start to see more and more of the positives. I found that we could work better as a team. I wasn't getting mad at him for the things that he wasn't doing good enough. I recognized, hey, this is my strength. Over here is his strength. When we come together, we are a powerhouse team. Let's utilize each other's strengths instead of trying to get mad at each other for the things we're not good at. So as we worked on that, it got easier and easier to do. I find myself still slipping in these four. Criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. I think it requires ongoing work. When I get stressed, when I get tired, I see that pattern starting in me where I, it's usually for me, it starts with the criticism. It starts with me just picking out little flaws and getting annoyed and getting frustrated and nitpicking. And I start to get critical. Over time, if I'm not careful, if I don't deal with those things, they are going to become contempt for me. I see that pattern in my life. So can I be a cautionary tale to you? Don't do that thing wherever you're at in your marriage, in your relationship. Even if you think, well, it doesn't matter what I do because my partner, my wife isn't going to try. She's quit. She's given up. Or my husband isn't going to work on these things. It's just going to be me doing all the work. Then fine. Let it be you doing all the work. Because you get to decide the kind of person you are. You get to decide how you're going to show up for your partner, for your kids. And trust me, if you're critical with your partner, you're going to be critical with your kids. You're going to start seeing all their flaws. You're going to be judgmental. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that sees the good in everyone. You want to be that person that's encouraging, that's uplifting, that's supporting. You want to be that person that is assertive, that can talk about issues, that can solve problems. I know that's who you want to be. You wouldn't be listening to this podcast, right, if you didn't want to be that person. So promise me, start right now and and commit. I'm going to be that person no matter what. No matter what my partner says, my husband, my wife, my kids, no matter how tired I am, I'm really going to work on this. I'm going to have grace. It's not always going to be perfect, but I'm really going to work on this. I'm cheering for you. I need to tell you, though, I did not get here on my own. I had a coach. I had help. I had mentors. So if you are ready to work on this thing, I want to encourage you. Book, if you haven't already, book a free strategy call. Let's have a free call. You can try out coaching. Let's see what you think about it. It'll be just a little quick little session. If nothing else, I can give you your first step. You're going to get some practical tip that you can use no matter what. But then you'll know what coaching is like and you'll know if it's something that's a fit for you. So the link is in the, the description of this podcast. Click on it and let's have a free call. I don't want you to try doing this all on your own without support. That is the best way, the quickest way to get the farthest on this is with somebody. We all have blind spots. So let me walk you home in this. If you want to work on your marriage, let's commit. I want to meet with you privately or with you and your partner together. We can work on some of these things. So don't allow those four horsemen in your marriage, criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Reach out to me. Let me know which one is your nemesis. Which one are you going to work on first? I'm cheering for you guys. Have a good day. Families Matter Most with Jen Dean, part of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network.